some really great uh, researchers from MIT and Stanford University and the chair of Waterfront Toronto and also the um, uh, top person at Thermae Canada who's doing Enterocles Redevelopment, the director of that project. So we got some top people in. That was really good to connect on the sort of cyborg origins of water, humans, and technology. Oh, is there a little bit of echo? Um, let me see. Is that better? I think that's good. Is that is, is the echo gone? It's interesting. I wonder what's if I need to kill the mute the mic on my phone. Let me try that. Is it gone? Is the echo gone? Or still there? Still there or gone? <laughs> Gone, good. Okay, so we got one good clear sound, one and only good clear sound. Okay, so that's good. So, yeah, the, it, we had a really great conference and we had lots of fun bringing all these great minds together. And uh, the videos are all posted up on the uh, Water HCI website. Just type in the chat here. Yeah, check it out. I think uh, it's too spot on relevant to a lot of what we're talking about here. So we got one more week left to classes. So our last live session will be in exactly one week. Last day of classes is seven days from now. April the 14th is the last day of classes. So this is our second last um, online uh, live lecture. So let's have a little bit of fun here. Last lecture, the very last lecture will be a review on the 14th in one week. So I'll just review everything. So today I want to talk a little bit about XR, extended reality. You know, there's all the different realities and XR is the one that Charles Wyckoff and I came up with in 1991. Now he invented a film called XR Film, Extended Response. And I said to him, let's just broaden this concept to extended reality. Because what I wanted to do is put on virtual reality glasses and see extended response originally. I thought this would be a really great way to see XR eyeglass. And then we said, well, we can do all the things, <coughs> all the things that you do in VR. We could do an XR because in VR you have games. And in VR, it's a virtual world. Of course, now there's all kinds of realities. There's augmented reality, mixed reality, and mediated reality and everything. But uh, XR is extended reality. And that extends the human senses and the human intellect, extending our heart, mind, and body to be able to see and understand the world around us in new ways. So HDR vision is one example of that being able to see through the eyeglasses with a dynamic range of 100 million to one. But then we started to say, well, this we can see other things and sense other things, more generally sensing, not just vision, but sensing in general. If we look at how we sense. So over there on the shelf, I've got that lock-in amplifier here. And this is the best amplifier that's ever made in human history made in 1961 and on it it's got various settings like PSD is low drift normal and high dynamic range so it's got this setting called high dynamic range on it this is that was really interesting and then I said well we can do the XR thing with signals in general we can do high dynamic range sensing in general not just not just for vision not just for seeing things but also for hearing things, HDR audio and HDR radar and HDR sonar, radio waves and sound waves. And when I was at the lab there, uh, this is the lab where a lot of the 
underwater experiments were done, like Jacques Cousteau collaborated with Harold Edgerton at the lab there, and I was at the, at, at the Strobe lab there, MIT 4-405, building four, room 405. At MIT, the buildings are all numbered, and everybody calls buildings by their numbers. People don't bother wasting time trying to learn the names of buildings. So 4-405 is a complete address for a room at MIT. And uh, on the fourth floor of Building 4, we'd hang out there. And that's where Jacques Cousteau uh, came to visit and do all these underwater experiments and fun things like that. The MI John Benedict at the MIT alumni pool was always helpful and cooperating. He was letting us do strange and wonderful experiments <clears throat> underwater. And one of the things that we'd often like to do is sonar and, and sound. And with sonar, we can do the same thing that we do with vision. We can see and understand signals by collecting different sensitivity settings. So that amplifier over there will pick up and lock in on signals. And essentially what a, a Doppler sonar device does is it sends out something and sees what comes back. And so these, these concepts are all kind of intertwined. Let me just go to my chalkboard camera there, which I've kind of zoomed in on cathode ray oscillograph there. And I'll go to live picture and picture so that you can still see my camera feed in the corner of the screen. that down a little bit so you can still see it. Now I'm just going to start another Jitsi so that I can make sure that, so hang on a second, we don't get feedback while I jump in on the visual Jitsi so I can see. Me. So you see here is screen of a oscillograph screen here. I'll just go wide here so you can see the whole table. So now what I have here is I've got this radar set and we've seen this uh, basic idea of a Doppler radar set it sends out something and sonar works in a similar way we do these underwater experiments with sonar and send out waves and see what comes back and the extended reality was to extend the ability to see in both uh, vision as well as as well as sound make here make sure you can hear it Audiovisual experiences in extended reality. And so here you can see I've got these waveforms here. One of these is the real part, and the other is the imaginary part of this radar Doppler return. As I move my hand there, when I move my hand faster, the waves walk down faster, and when I move it slower, it goes up and down slow. And so this is. Now let me just zoom in on that so we can see it a little bit better. Now one of the problems is you're seeing this at some frame rate. The thing about this oscillograph is it responds quickly. It's a cathode ray screen with a flying dot electron beam. So when I move my hand here within millionths of a second, less than a millionth of a second, that dot moves on the screen. Whereas the latency on this, what you're seeing on the screen is not at all like what I'm seeing in reality. Because when I see 
on the screen here, it's coming on a television screen on a back, on a raster graphics screen. And raster graphics is slow, so it has to wait a 60 of a second or something. And it's not really updating. And a lot of people say the human eye can only see, you know, a certain number of frames per second. People say, well, 24 or 30 or 60 frames a second is enough. But that's not really true because many people can see a flashing LED up to a kilohertz or, or so at least. So if, you ever, if you've ever looked at an actual cathode ray oscillograph rather than a modern allegoscope, like an Agilent uh, scope, what we sometimes call it an allegoscope because it says oscilloscope on the front cover of it. It alleges to be an oscilloscope. But it's not really an oscilloscope in the sense that it's more just a computer screen. It's displaying, it's trying to mimic what an oscilloscope does. So if you compare a real oscilloscope to an allegoscope, what you notice is that the oscilloscope shows you the actual waveform as it is. So an actual waveform here, what I see on my screen is a beautiful continuous waveform. What you'll see on your TV screen here on this Jitsi is a really awful looking uh, chopped up, busted up piece of, of, of uh, signal. But at least you can kind of get an idea that as I move my hand slowly like this, that waveform undulates slowly and when I move my hand quickly, it undulates quickly. And the real and imaginary part are in quadrature to one another, such that one is approximately the hope of transform of the other. When I'm when the signal's progressive, at least that is to say, I've just got one object that's moving towards the radar, and I'm moving that one object towards the radar, the relationship and phase between the real and imaginary part will be such as to go counterclockwise in the argon plane, which I think an XY plot of those two things. And when I move away from the radar, it'll go clockwise. In terms of the relationship, which one's the sine, which one's the cosine. It's a single component, but more generally, it'll be a broad band signal. And the imaginary part won't necessarily be the Hilbert transform of the real part, in which case then you've got various objects moving now in 1991, um, we came up with this, this thing called the Chirp of Transform to see growlers, to be able to visualize growlers for marine radar. That was my master's thesis. So I did my master's thesis in marine radar. So when I got to MIT, I started kind of connecting with the people in the lab here on a lot of these projects with sonar and things like that. <laughs> And Charles Wyckoff, in his invention of XR film, he called it XR film, which is extended response film. And it had different layers of emulsion on the photographic film. It was a color film that had three different layers, <coughs> each with a, a color dye in it. And, but it wasn't designed for color photography. It was a film designed for black and white photography with color film. And instead of having one layer of sensitive to red light and another sensitive to green and another sensitive to blue, all three light, all three layers had the same spectral sensitivity. They were all equally sensitive to all wavelengths of light. Um, but overall, one was very sensitive and the other was less very insensitive and one somewhere in between. <laughs> so the top layer was extremely sensitive to light. And the bottom layer was extremely insensitive to light, and the middle layer was somewhere in between. But they all had the same spectral response. That is to say, they had no preference. Like they, they all gave the same spectral tonality, so they, each layer was just a black and white film, but with a color dye in it. And so when that film was exposed, it would take a picture that was really overexposed on the top layer and grossly underexposed in the bottom layer and maybe properly exposed in the middle. And then when you viewed that as a color print, you could see fine details in the in the different layers of, of things. So he photographed a lot of nuclear explosions and things like that that had a wide range of light and was able to see a lot of those photographs on the color cover of Life magazine where you could see the fine details of the nuclear explosion without being overexposed coming from the bottom layer and all kinds of things like that, very high 
extreme things that you could photograph with that film. And so when I was working with him, I said, well, let's generalize this concept and let's make, make it instead of ex extended response, let's do something called extended reality instead of extended response only because I was interested in virtual reality and virtual reality uh, had mounted displays. And so I said, well, could we do this computationally? You know, could we capture differently exposed images and compute? And that's something I'd been working on for quite some time, actually. So this was just kind of an extension of this, but it kind of gave me new energy to kind of delve into this project a little bit more. So I said, okay, well, can we see reality in many different ways? settings so then we'd say well what do I do no matter what we're measuring we'll, whatever we're going to measure or sense we can sense it whenever you're taking a measurement in general we can say we're going to have one measurement at high gain so you have like three different gain levels there's a low gain measurement maybe a medium gain measurement and a high gain measurement and so we're measuring the same thing in three different ways. And so we would take this very low gain measurement of something and it might be like this, and then medium gain measurement of something like this, and then the high gain measurement will be, you know, clipped, like getting maximum value and strongly hit the limit of whatever the representation, either the numerical representation of how it's stored or some aspect of the sensing technology will be hitting its maximum. And so in, in very, as this waveform undulates, you know, like you might have a, an acoustic response from the sonar or something that's at very high frequency. So it's moving up and down really high frequency. Like, so as that waveform undulates, if you kind of magnify it, you look in a little piece of it somewhere you know there'll be parts of it that are that are, are fairly low level and then parts of it that, that are extreme and if you try to turn up the gain too much it'll just clip off these these uh, parts here and and not reproduce faithfully those, those extreme values so you have to turn the gain down and when you turn the gain down you miss all these low and it's quickly moving from these small signal parts to the small signal parts. So I said, okay, let's simultaneously grab it at different levels like that. And then in real time, we can analyze it. And in real time, we can take that, that signal and, and combine those in an optimum way and actually see and understand the world the way it truly is, get the true quantity or the, the true value in sonar or radar or audio or video or anything else. And then, so we can, <clears throat> we can explore and then we can make those explorations interactive. Because with sonar, for example, one of the things we used to like to do is a sequential wave and printing machine. We've got like a the oscillograph on the, on the screen here, this dot that's moving up and down. And we put it on a vessel, move it back and forth in the track here, and then photograph the wave, the sound waves, the radio waves on, on that vessel. But an interesting side effect is that we can see that as a group, lots of people can see it. So it's a shared. So X reality in this way is a shared experience. It's not just one person wearing a VR headset, but it's a shared experience that lots of people can enjoy together at the same time. Lots of people can watch this. And I made it larger ones with a long stick that had lamps on it that were controlled by a digital computer and that would light up. So it'd be fairly tall that you could see from quite a long distance away and then lots of people could see and experience this extended reality so shared so another attribute of extended reality was that it was a shared experience 
Additionally, in addition to being shared, it's also cybernetic. And Norbert Wiener come up, came up to this concept, there are many other people working on this too. Cybernetic uh, means that, like, like the term cybernetic comes from the Greek word for helmsman, which means steering a vessel or a boat. And so when you're steering a vessel through, through the water, you're in this feedback loop controlling the steering, and that's kind of where the idea of cybernetics originates from. Again, the world's first cyborgs were people on boats. Cyborgs and cybernetic, both of those terms come from vessels. So everything goes back to the water in a vessel, and we're steering a vessel. And so this XR experience should be cybernetic in the sense that it's a closed loop feedback. So we're living in a kind of computer generated world, if you will, where the virtual objects are experienced in, in this cybernetic fashion. So we're seeing everything as kind of a, um, in the cyborg space. So for example, we would be moving this around, you can, we, we would say, let's, let's move this vessel back and forth and explore the sound wave uh, return from the sonar on there, that bass band. And then other people can also participate too. So I might be moving towards another vessel and I'm looking at the return of the other vessel. Now, if I put this on the mast, this row of lights on the mast where the other vessel can see it, then both of us can be looking at this swim output while we're steering these vessels. So that's cybernetic extended reality because we're in a shared extended reality universe. Uh, instead of a shared virtual environment, it's a shared extended environment, collaborative. And so um, one of the technologies we developed was growler detection using marine radar to see and detect growlers. So you're approaching a growler, you can see that, and, and we can see the chirp of transform, and we can display also the swim and swim out the, the Doppler return from the growler. But we can also jump on the growler with a paddle, and while the vessel's approaching, just for fun, let's say you're in a small vessel, and it's just recreational, and we're gonna approach really slowly and safely so that we're not at risk of, of uh, crashing in. And now we could paddle the growler and, and someone standing on the growler paddling the growler looking at the same reality as the person who's standing in, who's in the vessel uh, there, there's a shared experience now we can create a game let's suppose we want to create a shared game a fun game that's cooperative rather than competitive we could say okay let's hold constant doppler so let's keep the swim from moving. Let's move ourselves in such a way that the swim doesn't move, meaning we have to keep our distance the same. So as the vessel paddles towards me, I got to paddle the growler away from the vessel to maintain a constant distance. And then as the vessel slows down, I got to slow down. And so our objective function is just to keep that, that uh, um, swim at a constant level. Now, uh, the swim is a real, say it's for displaying the real part of the, the radar return, we can also we have a complex value swim. And that's what we saw here on this oscillograph here, the real and imaginary parts. I mean, we have a row of lights, it can be a row of red lights for the real part and a row of green lights for the imaginary part dancing up and down. And now we can see whether we're going towards or away because we can see that pattern or, or we can display the, the uh, on an argon plane as an xy plot in a very dramatic sort of way which we used to do with small mirrors attached to loudspeakers to deflect the laser beam and the laser beam then becomes visible uh, in, in a large way so it were if we're at a pool or something like that going for a swim all try and swim in such a way that the dog is fine. We can all try to keep the Doppler shift constant, and that can be a fun game too, because you move your body along lines of constant Doppler shift. 
or another kind of game you can do is to try to position the, the cursor so we can say okay let's position this thing so if you're if we're in a large pool like the MIT pools not a large pool it's only a 25 yard pool but anyway good enough and now you're you've got some sonar system here and you can swim towards it which turns it counterclockwise on the screen or you can swim away which goes clockwise and if you want to make it go out from the center you increase your sonar cross-section by spreading your body out to make your turn stronger and if you want to move it towards the center you move your body in tight in to reduce its cross-section so that's a really kind of crude fun way to position the flying spot and then of course we sometimes play with video games like Pong or something like that and modify it to take the two analog inputs from the game paddles and then run them off of the outputs from the lock-in amplifier and then you play Pong by moving your body in the pool and these sonar pings. So you can do all kinds of fun things like that. And that's kind of a shared extended reality environment or XR. That's kind of what we mean by XR, getting back to the cyborg roots getting back to the roots of cybernetics. He's here. Now, we, at the time, we just used speakers because we didn't have any funds to buy fancy stuff like this, but um, so the speakers, people were throwing away. And, but now you can get these sorts of little galvanometer things like these. This little thing here. So these little things here, they, they these control these are mirrors that are controlled in their position. And so there's two of them here. They're nicely mounted. So the two mirrors are positioned in such a way that that they can guide a laser beam under control and these things respond very quickly direct the beam whichever direction we want it to go based on those inputs so if anyone wants to work on that over the summer you can have some fun with that lasers here and, and the idea is you shine a laser at that and it's directed and it's a flying spot and it's a fun little experiment we did back in the 1980s and 1990s it's always fun to reproduce some of these early results just as teaching examples because i kind of want to take a lot of the fun that i had in the early days and bring it to the students as teaching examples because these fun things are very simple and they teach fundamental physics probably learn a lot more than just writing some Python code and doing AI approach because you're learning really fundamental physics. So we did AI and machine learning as humanistic intelligence upon these, these different waveforms. Like the triplet transform is, a, is an AI machine learning, but it's done at a fundamental level where you kind of understand what's going on. So that's, that's one example of, of, of XR as, as a shared space. So the way the way this swim works is you'll have one of these kind of locking amplifiers like this, and we'll have, we'll have a sonar transducer in the water, and the wire coming out of it, sound waves come out of it, and when you it's usually a piezoelectric crystal that expands and contracts when voltage is applied across it, and when the voltage is applied across it, it puts sound waves out. And then when sound hits it, it produces voltage. You just have to be careful though, because if you throw it into cold water, it'll produce voltage because suddenly it contracts, changes shape or size with cold water and produces voltage. So a lot of people have to 
sauna plug into the amplifier and just throw it in the water and it fries the front of the amplifier, burns everything out because it generates a high voltage coming out and suddenly shot with cold water. So a lot of times what people want to do is put it in the water first and then plug it into the amp after it settles to the right temperature. So you got this in the water here. And it's connected to a signal generator. Signal generator is generating a tone here. And you know, it's like an SQ34 uh, microphone, for example. It'll work pretty good from about one cycle per second, about five cycles per second, uh, very well optimally, but it'll go up to about 100 cycles per second to some degree quite well. So about one cycle per second to 100 cycles per second, 100,000 cycles per second in the KCPS. And we can put that on a signal generator and send out a wave here feed a little bit of that signal into the reference input of the lock and amplifier. And then we take another sonar transducer, another one, and put that into the signal input of the lock and amplifier. And then the output the lock and amplifier goes into the swim, which is this fine spot safe. It could be one dimensional there. It's just the real part. If you've got a complex lock and amplifier, which is just basically another lock and amplifier. Some, some lock and amplifiers have both these functions in it, so you can have another one. And then you just put your reference through a 90 degree phase shifter, and you put your signal input also into that, and then you've got your other one, that's your matching input. And so now, if we drive the XY plot of these, then we have the swim that Oftentimes, you see this on the r plane as you move these transducers back and forth with respect to one another. Now, if one of these transducers is attached to this display and moves with it, and the other one's fixed, then we're obviously going to swim out the physical quantity that we're seeing. Like this is what allows us to see the sound waves or radio waves with the with this apparatus. <laughs> that you can see the waveform. And so being able to see and explore these waveforms allows us to kind of understand the waveform. Functionality is just, for example, the reference signal, the reference input is multiplied by the signal input, and then the result is low-pass filter, such that we end up with something that's a function of only space rather than space and time. And this way it's shearing the space-time continuum so that we're in a set of coordinates in which the speed of wave propagation is zero. So it puts us in, if you will, it's kind of like a virtual world in which the speed of light is zero or the speed of sound is zero. But it's, it's actually reality. Um, it's the real world. And this is what we mean by extended reality. It's not a virtual, fictitious world, but it's a true and accurate depiction of world as it really is. It's just these things that are otherwise invisible that are made visible. So we can see the waves just sitting perfectly still there. So now if we if we move something back and forth like that we see it. But we can also take these two and put them together side by side. Instead of moving that one with respect to this one. We can put the two of them side by side. And that comes in here, signal input. And then these waves are bounced over here. Waves come out of this one, and back into that one again, bouncing off of some object. And if we put the swim on that object that's moving, then again we'll swim out the waveform. Of course, it'll be collapsed by a factor of two times, two times scale, because the sound has to go there and then back again. But now we can swim that out. And so we, we developed a little app. We developed a little smartphone app, which is a sonar, sonar app built into Android. So we can swim something out 
and see this effect, observe this effect of extended reality or seeing sound waves and radio waves in general, but in this, in this, in this case, just sound and so on. And if you have an external connector, you can plug in a headphone jack or something, plug in an external speaker or microphone. One and the other one can be with the phone and the other can be external. Then we can move these relative to one another and see the swim effect. And if we can plug in an external speaker and an external microphone, we can plug in two hydrophones, in fact. Then we can put that underwater and move those back and forth. Put the smartphone on a little vessel that moves along with a hydrophone underneath it in the water. Then we can swim out the sound waves in the water. So that's another thing that, that can be a lot of fun if you if anyone wants to work over the summer on this, we're going to make some teaching things for next year. Teaching apps. I want to get supported to iOS as well, too, so that we can make it available on Android and iOS as a sonar app to turn your smartphone into a sonar app for teaching and research and fun. So this, <laughs> this kind of takes us to extended reality. 91 XR and that, that's kind of one one form of reality. Now of course there's so many different realities. VR, originally VR is the original one. And then there's um, you know, AR is more recent, I guess. And there's all these different realities. And then we finally wrote a paper called All Reality. If you search for All Reality, yeah, kind of, you'll find some nice, interesting commentary on the realities, as we call them. So now we've got this, this, this introduction to, to these different realities. Just turn my hat around so you can, it doesn't block the chalkboard camera and from overhead. So now we, we have all these different forms of reality that allow us to explore and understand the world. So hopefully you've learned something in this course at least learn something about reality and kind of the, 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 the origins, I guess, of X reality in sonar and sensing and Doppler shifts and those sort of fundamental things. So Doppler sonar as implemented by concept of phase coherent detection, PSD, which is basically what a lock-in amplifier does. These, these amplifiers from the 1960s and 1970s we're sort of all about doing that kind of phase coherent detection, PSD, or lock-in amplifier, or phase sensitive detector. And what happens there is we, we have a comparison between what's being sent out and what's being received. We sometimes call that a homodyne receiver to, to de deconflate it with the concept of a, of a heterodyne or super heterodyne receiver, like modern radio receiver that multiplies the local oscillator by what comes into frequency shifted. In this case, our, our reference signal comes from what we send out. And this we sort of homodyne that signal with whatever comes out, whatever comes back. And so we can look in frequency space and see uh, what the frequency shift is. And then of course, there's a, an uncertainty relation Heisenberg uncertainty relation between time and frequency. 
So we have pulse Doppler where we send out pulses. Sonar or radar sends out a pulse that travels through the air or through water or even through solid matter. We can look at waves propagating in solid matter and SWIM allows us to understand and see these waves propagating through air or, or liquid or solid matter, solid, liquid or gas, wave propagation. And so the waves propagate through and then we can see what comes back when we homodyne those signals together and, and swim it out. And so that's kind of what we're looking at these early explorations. And that kind of takes us to active vision radar, sonar, and LIDAR, how these new smart self-driving cars often see. And of course, one of the problems is these active vision systems blind each other. So, you know, if, if we have multiple sonar sets in the pool, it gets kind of noisy and the, the sonars confuse each other. Likewise, radars confuse each other and LIDARs confuse each other. And so you have all these vision systems that are making it tough to see. Just from a practical point of view, I would sometimes walk into some place with a seeing aid like this, and then they'd have these infrared surveillance cameras with really bright infrared lights. So it's hard to see because the light was shining in my face. So then I had to put an infrared light on my on my eyeglasses so I could see properly. And then when I walked in, they sometimes they have a little television screen hanging from the ceiling that shows you that says don't steal, you're on camera. And when I walked in, the screen would go completely white so they couldn't see me. So it came down to a choice between me being able to see or them being able to see. And I figure it's more important that I don't trip and fall because I can see where I'm going than it is for them to be able to see whether or not I'm stealing something. So we had this, this kind of fun, crazy uh, arguments and debates about who should be able to see. And is it more important for humans to see or for buildings to see? what has priority, smart cars or smart people. And so that was always this, this and so that whole thing is going to unfold right now. There's so few of them, this isn't really a problem, but as soon as they get lots of them on the road, we're going to have all these things come back up again. Memories of multiple radars and multiple sonars from our early experiments. Now we're going to see all that come back to the forefront spectrum gets really cluttered and we need to start to think about channel coding capacity and how to make vision systems active that can coexist with each other. So if you understand triplet transform and, and other encoding rather than just Fourier, if you only know Fourier based or wavelet based, you're not going to be able to look at accelerating objects. But if you're looking at growlers, for example, they're accelerating and so do other things do cars accelerate, lots of things accelerate. So, and periodic waveforms, like growlers bob up and down periodically. So their Doppler shift is sinusoidally varying frequency shift. But if you're doing ultrasound of the heart, we also built a little ultrasound wearable thing that uses sonar to, to look into the heart. So we made a super low cost wearable ultrasound device that does ultrasound on your heart while you're jogging or walking around. And that was kind of fun because what you see there is that the similar ideas, there's a cyclic movement, which comes across as this chirping for which the chirplet transform is an optimal way of doing signal processing and machine learning on those heart waveforms. Maybe you can see if you've got COVID or something because your heart's less chirpy or whatever heart rate variability chirp of the chirp, which is a meta chirp because the Doppler return <coughs> of a cyclically moving object that's moving at a steady frequency is, is a chirp, a warble, it actually, a warble. But if the heart rate is, is heart rate variability, HRV, then that chirp itself is chirping. So the warble is chirping. And so how do we analyze that return? That would be a really good master's or PhD thesis for one of you, if there's one of you that wants to pursue some of these ideas. Uh, let me know and continue working on some summer fun. We've been bringing some people in over the summer, summer jobs, all that kind of stuff. Or if you need help getting placed somewhere in Silicon Valley or MIT or Stanford, let me know. I can try to help out and try to help 
find some fun thing that you can do over the summer and learn something. So anyway, I hope that this course has been fun. And next week is our last uh, live session, which will be a review. So if you have any questions or anything like that about the course or anything in general related, you know, or just life in general, how to, how to find your way through life, feel free to let me know. And uh, then we'll have our, our last lecture and then, and then we, and then finally the exam. And I guess the exam will be sort of a bittersweet moment because I'll meet many of you for the first time and it might be the last time we meet too. There's always something sad about last day when you might, some people don't see them again. And so there's something crazy sad about being a professor and seeing people on their way. But hopefully I've done the best I can to instill love and passion of the subject matter and learn something. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week. And I really look forward to meeting in real life at the exam. So on that note, I guess, does anybody have any questions about anything so far? So I think everybody understands the material. Go through those uh, Water HCI videos because there's a lot of really good content in there. There's, I gave some insight on some of the material, but there, and there's also some really good, uh, really good pieces like that MIT professor is doing some really great sensing and underwater internet of things. And there's lots of really great developments going on there. So take a look at what's happening in the world. There's just so much happening in the world. And so we were able to bring everything together and make it, make it be lots of fun. Okay, is there any sample exam that we can practice on? There are lots of old sample exams floating around the internet. I wouldn't rely on them too heavily though, because the thing is that the subject matter, I update things, I try to update things. I try not to just deliver the same thing every year. Some professors just crank out the same thing every year. But what I try to do is pick up on current trends and events and patterns and things like that and kind of guide us towards new understanding each year. So yes, feel free to, to look around. Um, if you search ECE 516, just do a web search on it. You'll find tons of stuff. You can hunt around on back pages. I keep all the back pages online too. So if you do it, if you just search ECE 516, you'll probably get a lot of hits on wearcam.org. And you'll find lots of old exams and old notes and what you can take a look at what we did last year and the year before there's some similarities in, in the courses but there'll be obviously there'll be some questions in past exams that we didn't cover this year so don't get discouraged if if there's something there that uh, that looks like it's a little bit tough to deal with or whatever The main thing is, you know, have some fun and, and, and try and go over everything you've learned. And... And, any other questions? Oh, what, what's the highlights of Water HCI? That's a good question. That's a really good question, actually. If I look at, let's say, if I go through, I can quickly go through it right now. Um, I'll just share my screen and then you'll see screen two. It'll be give video feedback for a second. And then I'll go to Water HCI. And speakers. Now, if I go back to the Jitsi. Can you guys tell me in the chat if you can all see that screen when I went to it? <coughs> Obviously I'm back to the main screen now. Yes, so you can all see that, that water HCI screen. So I've got it by session here. 
And so I would say that some of the highlights, some of the really interesting things from the point of view of what this course, the depth of level, the depth of thinking that's involved in this course, I, I would say you certainly want to look at at, um, at the, the 5 p.m. Um, talk, which is uh, Fadel Adib, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, bringing Internet of Things to the underwater world. That talk was really mind blowing. And that, you know, really, there's some interesting, like, he's a deep thinker in terms of really achieving things and, and doing something uh, in terms of of imaging and image processing, if you if you look at the two thirty talk by Professor Chris Hauser, that's related to intelligent image processing and machine learning, and so is the three p.m. talk. The two thirty and the three are are intelligent image processing. Machine learning is a great example to, to also look at. Like you know, if you if you don't have time to watch the whole thing probably those three will give you like a close alignment to the to the depth and because they tie into all kinds of research too you can look at those talks and start to probe into some of the literature in those areas and of course the proceedings definitely read skim, uh, read or at least skim through the proceedings, the published proceedings. It's a short 22 page document, just latex so overleaf. So it's pretty easy to buzz through that in, in, a, in a quick cursory way and zero in on anything that's relevant there. Okay, so it was fun today and I'm gonna enjoy doing the recap in one week, kind of summarizing everything. And if there's any questions that anybody has, hit me up with the questions this week so that I got time to, to integrate the questions into my summary in one week. Beautiful. Okay, well, thanks for joining. And until next week.